And welcome back. It is Rothenberg on Talk. I, I can't even believe the amount of stuff that we have to get into today. It's your normal staples. It's Stump Rothenberg, of course. It's story time. I got a doozy. I got to be honest. I actually feel still to this day, and it's got to be like 17 years ago, still feel guilty about the story that I'm going to share with you today. A um, couple of other things in the world of sports that have me really bothered, troubled, some would say. What's going on with Tim Tebow? We have to get into that. Fan behavior at some of these NBA games is absolutely repulsive. It's a very busy show. The Mets are down to their fifth, five, fifth center fielder and still somehow winning games. It's a mess. Yankees, they're a mess as well. Let's get rolling. It's Rothenberg on Talk right now. There is no more passionate fan than I am. I, I love my teams. I've been known to get naked around my teams winning or losing important games. But something has me so bothered right now in the world of sports and with sports fandom. I, I, we have to get into it. it. It is driving me crazy. I'm sure you saw at this point now the other night. Russell Westbrook, he's injured, okay? He hobbles off the court. He's leaving the game in Philadelphia, and these savage fans, and I'll say that Philadelphia fans are savage fans, but I'll say it for other fans as well. These savage fans, or a fan, dumps popcorn on him, and, and appropriately, he has a complete meltdown. Now, rightfully so. Could you imagine if you're at a Broadway show and Nathan Lane is, like, right in front of you, and you, you throw something at him? That's what this is, people. You're going to, in essence, an athletic version of a Broadway show. And for people to act like this is nothing short of mind-boggling to me. Then that's repulsive. And that's Philadelphia. And people say, well, this, it never used to be like this. Never used to be like this. Uh, do you remember the time that Michael Irvin, they had to bring out spinal decompression, right, for him. And he's lying on the turf at, at the vet. And they're, they're applauding it. And they're chanting it. Now, there, there's different things, though. To actually physically accost one of the players is, is absolutely repulsive. So you have that going on in Philadelphia. Now, I'm a Knicks fan. A lot of people are Knicks fans. It's an amazing story what they're doing. The Garden has been at an unbelievable fever pitch over the postseason so far. But the other night, now we're in a pandemic. Can we, how much worse can you actually make this story? We're in the, hopefully the tail ends of a pandemic right now, okay? And then Trey Young is at the Garden, game's over, and a fan spits on him? What kind of an animal? What kind of a savage can you possibly be that you would think, hey, in this moment, let me spit on another human being? In an era of pandemic, in a time where you don't want to go within six feet of somebody else, you're spitting on somebody. So we have major problems. They're, they're real. I mean, how you have the audacity to believe for a second that you're you you are it's within your reason, within bounds that you're allowed to to spit on someone or or throw popcorn on a, on an athlete. It, it is it is beyond uh, understanding, really. And this has been going on for a long time. Now, I don't know if we've gotten worse or it was social media and 24-hour nonstop coverage that we have just approached this avenue of where we're at. But I remember going to a Giants game. God, it's got to be in the, in the early 90s. And I think the game was on a Saturday. And they're playing the Chargers. And the fans start to, to, to you know, make snowballs and ice balls at the game and throw it at the Chargers players. And they actually hit some people in the face and in the head, and they had to, like, rush the Chargers off of the field at the time. Now, they found out who those people were, and they revoked their season tickets. Even this far, and I always thought this was interesting, if they were your season tickets, and you gave them to someone else, and that person threw snowballs, ice balls at the other team, your season tickets were revoked even if you were not at the game. Here's what we have to do with these people now. And I, and I, and I mean this. Almost like the Scarlet Letter. You have to publicly shame people. I mean, when you watch these 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 lunatics in the park, you know, these Karens in the park that are freaking out, and all of a sudden this kind of stuff is made public, what happens? They lose their jobs. Let's make this stuff public. If you're going to spit on Trey Young, you know what? Here's what's going to happen. You're banned for life from going to Madison Square Garden. You should be on some kind of a watch list from going to no games. It needs to go on your public record, and let's push it all the way through. You're done. Your job, you're done. I mean, you know what happens if you run onto the field at a stadium and you're streaking down the 50-yard line and you're arrested? You can lose your job. You know what? Let's push it all the way here with this situation as well. If you're at a game and you have the audacity to throw something at a player, to spit on a player, you know what? You're done. You're never coming to a game again. 
you're going to be banned from going to really, on, honestly, any game ever in the future. Now, I don't know how you how you employ that, to be honest with you, right? So argument's sake, I, I do it. Now, I would never do it. And, and th that's the thing that I don't understand, okay? I'm as rabid and crazy of a fan as anybody that walks the face of the earth. But there are people that take it so far, they think it's okay to go even crossing that line. But let's say for argument's sake that it's me. And I do this. And I'm banned from going to the Garden. And someone on the staff here says, David, I got two tickets to go to the Garden for the game next Thursday night. How in the world are, are they going to have any idea that I'm not supposed to be there? So that's, a, that's another thought as well. But I just, I can't believe we're here. But you know what? If you're an employer and your employee does something, if you find out that your employee has spit in, in a key moment of a game, on one of the players, you don't think that maybe it's time to move on from that guy? You want that person working for you, representing your company? We should publicly, as much as we humanly can, shame these animals from doing stuff like this. I go back to my original thought. You are basically buying tickets to sports theater. Could you imagine going to a Broadway show and spitting on Bernadette Peters? The answer unequivocally is no. And these people shouldn't be allowed to do it either. All right, something that has me, I mean, hot, re really hot, and even hotter than, than these, these very warm lights are right now, but something that has me really hot. What, what the hell is going on with Tim Tebow? Can somebody please explain to me this infatuation that Urban Meyer has with, and listen, I'm sure he's a great guy. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm comfortable enough to tell you, I think he's a very handsome guy. He has not played in the NFL in eight years he has not played in the NFL in eight years, and now we're going to give him the role of tight end or backup tight end on the Jaguars. So I get it that maybe you could even look at Urban Meyer and where he stands in his NFL coaching career and say he owes this opportunity to Tim Tebow. I get that. That's fair. You could say he owes a lot to Alex Smith too, right? I mean, he started at Utah. Well, he actually started at Bowling Green. I don't know if he could find someone from there. But then he goes to Utah. Alex Smith, they go undefeated, they beat Pitt in that game, and, and all of a sudden now he's he's a legend. Then he goes to Florida, and he finds this quarterback, Tim Tebow, okay? And Tebow wins a championship for him. And for some reason now, he's indebted to this guy for the rest of his life. It makes absolutely no sense to me. So eight years, think about, eight years ago, the Knicks were relevant. That's how they're relevant again now. But eight years ago, the Knicks were winning playoff games. Eight years since he's last played in the NFL. He's played with the Mets. I mean, if, if he wants to go anywhere, he can go. He could go with the Mets. He could do The Bachelor. He can marry Miss America. Whatever the world he wants to do, he can do. And for some reason, I almost feel, do you remember the episode of Seinfeld when Kramer was living a fantasy life and Jerry says, you 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 wake up you you step in ass backwards into into money and women and and everything that you want every single day you're living a fantasy camp well you know what Tim Tebow is living a real life version of a fantasy camp and I'm not saying he's not a great guy he might be the greatest guy in the world but are you kidding me right now you got I mean at this point Tim Tebow is getting more shots and I I got to go further with this now as well so I got Timo Tebow who's going to be my what second or third string tight end and you've seen him attempt to be a tight end in this league it did not go well so now he's eight years in between stints in the NFL and now you learn that now they draft Trevor Lawrence with the top overall selection Every expert, any analyst, anybody that covers the NFL, anybody involved with the draft says that Trevor Lawrence is such a surefire success story in the league. And now it turns out that it sounds like Urban Meyer actually wants to use Tim Tebow in special wildcat packages, maybe at the goal line, maybe in third or fourth and short. What is happening? You just drafted a guy who's, who's the number one pick who they say since Andrew Luck, since John Elway, we have not seen someone of this talent. He has not lost a, a regular game, a regular season game ever. High school undefeated in the regular season. College undefeated in the regular season. And you're going to think about playing Tim Tebow in third and short situations. What is happening? How is this even possible? I guess he must be very likable. I got to be honest. I wish I was that likable. I mean, people would do whatever. Oh, Dave, would you like the pizza place? You can own it. Take it over for the weekend. Dave, you want to run the diner? It's yours. Have at it. You know what? If I was more likable, maybe I could run the Wildcat for the Giants. It is unbelievable that this is something that could possibly happen right now 
in the NFL. All right, so that's Tebow. That's the Jaguars. That's the mess that is that. But something that's really rolling along, and it pains me to say, because I'm a Rangers fan, and talked about on the radio the other day, Mato, 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 the Rangers' huge goal. I believe it was May 27th of 1994 when he scored uh, at 424 of double overtime against the Devils to win that game 2-1. to one. But how about what the Islanders are doing now, huh? They are, without their captain, Anders Lee out. Their goalie, Varlamov, he was expected to be the guy that would carry them throughout the postseason. He has not played all that well in the postseason. So what do they do? They, they play the kid. He's not played at all in the postseason. They pop him in there. He wins his first game. He wins his second game. He wins his third game. And he closes out the series by winning his fourth game as well. So Sorokin, with no playoff experience, wins four straight games to start his postseason career. I got to tell you. And we talked about it on last episode about Tom Thibodeau, and he's as good a coach in any sport as there is in any league right now. Barry Trotz may not be far behind. So their goalie, who's up for the Vezina Award, is not good enough that they can play him. Their captain, Anders Lee, you know what? He's out for the entire postseason with a knee injury. And still they find a way to beat Pittsburgh in six. A series, and let's be fair, they probably shouldn't have won. Pittsburgh was the better team. They stole that series. Now, moving forward, how do they beat Boston? They played their game. They got to get out to Leeds, and they got to play close to the best, and they have to keep this very low scoring. I don't think they did. They, they can. Now, I actually picked the Islanders to win the series against Pittsburgh in six. So good on me for that. But I don't know about this next series. I'll make a pick for you right now. Boston, the Bruins, win this series in six. But it doesn't take anything away from what the Islanders have done this year. It's another great run for the great coach, Barry Trotz and the Isles. It's just about. We're on the verge of story time with Rothenberg. And I know you're excited. And I'm excited as well. But I want to tell you first about a product that I have started to use. It's phenomenal. On Tucket shirts. Look at the, first of all, look at this shirt. It's phenomenal. It, 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 is, it is beautiful. It fits me. And I, and you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know what kind of guy I am. I like to untuck. Like, I was untucking for years. I've been the guy. I would go to a party. There's the untucked guy, right? Even before this was a company, I didn't like to tuck in. And my wife would tell me, you tuck in. No, I untuck. That's who I am. Well, here's the beauty of the untucked shirt. It's supposed to be actually worn untucked. So you go to a party, you're untucked. It's not too long. It's not slovenly looking. It looks appropriate. If you have not tried an untucked shirt, I'm telling you, take it from me. This is genuine. This is legitimate. You are making a monumental mistake. So try the untucked shirt. Just go to untuckit.com. Okay? If you need the perfect gift for Father's Day, get dad, get grandpa, right? Get your son. It doesn't matter. I, I, you even have to be a dad. Probably not, right? But if you need the perfect gift for Father's Day, just go to untuckit.com. Shirts designed to be worn as we have discussed, untucked. Here's a special bonus code, okay? Special bonus code, everyone. Use code DAVE. See, that's my name, D-A-V-E, for 20% off your first purchase at untuckit.com. That's untuckit.com, U-N-T-U-C-K-I-T.com. All right, story time with Rothenberg. This is embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you because this is what I do. I bring you into my inner labyrinth of the world and the, the lunacy that I live in. I, I'm, I've moved into my apartment, our apartment, I guess I would say, with my beautiful, not even fiance at the time. We move in in September of 03. We get engaged in December of 03. But there's something in November of 03 that happens in New York City every single year. It's known as the New York Marathon, and that's where this version of Storytime with Rothenberg will take us. So my wife has run three marathons prior to this one, but it's the first one that she's known me for, and she's very excited. I can't wait for you to go to the Javits Center with me and pick up my number and get all the free gifts and meet me in the finish line, and it's going to be so wonderful. And I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there every step of the way for you. And I said, so when, when do we go to the Javits Center? When do we pick up your number? When do we, you know, um, get all the goodies that they give you? When, when do we do all these different things? And she says, well, the Friday afternoon, we go to the Javits Center. And then, of course, you'll meet me the Sunday at the finish line. And you'll bring me home and we'll celebrate. And I said, well, ha hang on a moment now. The, the Sunday, um, that's a football Sunday. And 
the Giants are playing the Jets. So I don't know that I can be this finish line kind of guy with you. But I'll go to the Javits Center. And she says, hang on. We just moved in together. We're going to get engaged. We will be married. We will have children. This could be the last marathon that I run. And you will not be there at the finish line for me? People travel all over the, all over the world to be there waiting for their significant other at the finish line. I said, for those people, that's great. For this guy, that's not happening. So I explained to her, here's what I'll do for you, though. Giants played the Jets 1 o'clock on Sunday. Now, we lived on 86th Street and 2nd Avenue in New York City. And the marathon, for those of you that don't know, actually runs all the way up 1st Avenue. So it's beautiful. I said, here's what we'll do. You go, you run. I'll meet you on the corner of 86th and 1st, but you have to be there before 1 o'clock. And she's like, I don't know that I can run that fast to be there before 1 o'clock. I said, sorry, these are, these are the parameters we're working under. Get there before 1 o'clock. I'll meet you there. I'll bring a sign. I'll cheer. I'll scream. I'll be the loudest guy at the marathon, but make sure you're there before 1 o'clock. So I make my way. This this five lines deep, but I'm, I wriggle my way through. I get up to the front of the line. I'm holding up a sign. I'm excited. Then here she comes, right? And it's 1253. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, let's move a little faster. We're kicking off in seven minutes here, right? So she gets up. I'm so proud of you. You give her, she stops, a hug and a kiss. I'm so proud. This is so wonderful. It's amazing. She's like, did you bring a banana? I'm like, no, I didn't bring a banana. How would I know about a banana, right? I don't run. But, well, you don't have anything? No. I said, why don't you go on your way? She's like, don't you want to spend a couple minutes to talk to me? I said, no. I got to get back. I got to do my own sprint here. I got to get back to the apartment to watch the Giants and the Jets. I'm sorry. I can't wait. So I get this look of terror, and she goes on her way. All right? Now, Giants are winning this game 28-14. I'm alone in the apartment. Things are good. They're rolling along. All of a sudden, the Jets score a touchdown 28-21. The Jets score another touchdown, 28-28. We go to overtime. At that very moment that overtime is about to start, the door opens. Now, this poor woman, my wife, has taken the Crosstown bus after finishing the New York City Marathon, and she walks into the apartment to a savage. And she says, I ran the marathon in three hours. And I said, do me a favor. Can you please be quiet? I'm watching the end of the game. It's falling apart. I can't deal with this right now. She says, there were people at the finish line who traveled from India to meet their significant other, watch them run 26.2 miles, and you're across town, and you can't even make it there for me? I said, listen, this is what you're signing up for, just knowing in advance. And that is what we like to refer to as the unfortunate marathon story. Can you believe what's happening with the New York baseball teams right now. Now, the Yankees are, are kind of a mess with injuries. I mean, Kluber's going to be out for, looks like, about two months. Luke Voigt, I mean, that doesn't sound like a good injury. It sounds like he's going to miss an extended period of time. Aaron Hicks, starting center fielder. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I never understood this allure around Aaron Hicks. Like, we got to bat him third. I don't know why. I always thought he was a very average, mediocre player. Got to sign him to long term. You can't let a guy like Aaron Hicks walk away. But that's not the point. The point is he's a, a serviceable center fielder. Looks like he's going to be out for the year now as well. So the Yankees are struggling. And I got to tell you this, and I, I admit when I'm wrong. A lot of people do not like to do that. I don't like to, but I will. I don't understand the Tampa Bay Rays. I, I, for the life of me, I cannot figure out how this team continues to win baseball games year after year after year. They're in, almost the entirety of their bullpen is different now. Right, right, from what they were last year, and they were so good, to what they are now this year, all, really, almost the entire bullpen is completely different. Yet, all they do is win. I think they won 12 games in a row. Then, then they lost, then they win again. I mean, they are... Uh, if, if they actually spent money, do you know who they'd be? They'd be the Dodgers. That's who they'd be. If they had money to spend, they would be the Dodgers. They just traded their starting shortstop. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if you're the Yankees, you're like, oh, Glaber, we'll, we'll move on from him because we have better behind him? No, teams don't do that. But somehow, some way, they are as efficiently and well-run as any team in all sports right now. So the Yankees, uh, but the Yankees have played better. Uh, Judge has certainly gotten hot. Yankees, I think, will be fun. What I cannot believe, and I don't know that I've ever seen this ever before, ever, ever, and that's the amount of injuries uh, surrounding the Mets right now. It is nothing short of remarkable. Let's run through what the Mets are, okay? First base, you figure, all right, Pete Alonso, good. No, he's out, okay? Second base, Jeff McNeil, so we're good there. He's every day. No, he's out. Sounds like he's not going to be back till the end of June. Shortstop, all right, Lindor, I don't have to worry about him. Well, he's in, and he stinks. 
Oh, he's hitting 185. This is now two months. And then the big thing is, are you allowed to boo Francisco Lindor, right? On Sports Talk Radio in New York, it's a hot, you can't boo. How can you boo? It doesn't help him. I can boo. You're hitting 185 through May. I, I can boo the hell out of you if I want to boo you. Third base, J.D. Davis, he's out. My, my first baseman now is, is the starting catcher in James McCann. Dom Smith, he's missed time. He wasn't able to play a, a bunch this past week. Center field, all right. So center field, I got Nimmo. He's out. Well, I, I, I got Pilar. Well, he's out. I, I got the guy from the Cubs. I can't even say his name. Well, he, he's out. I, I got Fargus. He's out. I'm on my fifth string center fielder. Hey, let's make a trade. Let me scour the waivers. Let me look at guys that are, oh, let's make a trade for Cameron Mabin and bring him in. He's worse than me, honestly. Like, I might be able to do what he's done so far in, in Major League Baseball. I think he's like 0 for 30 right now uh, since he joined the Mets. This week, a man by the name of Billy McKinney was acquired and batted third. Think about that. Let's acquire a guy because we're so desperate and bat him in the middle of the lineup. So that's what they do there. And some of they're winning games. I don't know how the Mets keep their head above water. I give them a lot of credit. Oh, and by the way, Conforto, yeah, he's out as well. And that's not to mention Lugo. And that's not to mention Carrasco. And it's not to mention Syndergaard. And it's not to mention DeGrom, who spent time on the IL. And it's not to mention Stroman, who's actually been hurt this year. The fact that the Mets are sitting here in first place is nothing short of an absolute miracle. Can they keep their head above water? There's your million-dollar question. I got to be honest. I do not really care for the managerial strategies and the way that Luis Rojas handles the media, but this guy has done a phenomenal job so far this season with the Mets. If you would have actually told me back in February that the Mets would be without their first baseman, Second baseman, shortstop, who you just spent $341 million on, is going to be hitting 185. No third baseman. The free agent catcher would be awful. The left fielder would be awful. The center fielder, starter, second, third, fourth, would all be out. And the starting right fielder would be out. Syndergaard would be pushed back. No Lugo. DeGrom's been on the IL. And that they'd be in first place. This is, I let, let's be fair. You would have signed for this in a heartbeat. You would be thrilled with the prospect of being in first place. And also, the NL East has not been great. We looked, we all looked at the Braves as this, this juggernaut, this power. I mean, you look, they got Ozuna and Freddie Freeman and, and they're pitching and Anderson and Freed and they're, they're, they're going to win 97 games. You know, I got to tell you, they're not. Washington, they're not that great. Scherzer's phenomenal. Strasburg's missed time. They're fine. They're nothing special. Philadelphia, I don't think that's a special team by any stretch. So every single team in the National League East is completely flawed. And how about the Marlins? Did you hear what Don Mattingly said? He said he said baseball is unwatchable now. Don Mattingly, Clayton Kershaw talked about the no hitter the other day and is completely turned off by where we are. Guys, we got to be honest now. That baseball is broken. I love it. I mean, I watch. I went to the Mets games when they're the, you know Doug Sisk is pitching for them and and Craig Swan and Joel Youngblood and 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 you know John Stearns was the big draw. But let's be honest. There's a major issue going on with Major League Baseball right now. We, all it is is strikeouts. That all, that's all it is. It's either a home run or it's a strikeout. It's bland. It's boring. There's no juice. There's no excitement. You have guys hitting 50-plus home runs every single day a couple of years ago. And now all of a sudden, it, 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 the pitchers are dominating. So what did they do? They changed the ball that much to now it's completely unhittable. Can we get rid of the Vaseline on the hat? Can we get rid of the rosin uh, under the cap? Can we get rid of all these things that are, that are giving the pitcher the advantage? Can we just play regular baseball? I, I mean, if you're a 15-year-old kid or you're even younger, I'm a parent. I have a 10-year-old. Now, he has no choice because I kind of force him into it. But do you think that 8, 10, 12-year-old kids are looking at the game of baseball and saying to themselves, oh, I, I love this. Let, let's sit down and watch a three-and-a-half-hour Yankees-Red Sox game on a Friday and then go to bed and wake up and do it again the next afternoon at 1 o'clock for four hours and 12 minutes of nine-inning Yankees baseball against the Red Sox. I, I really I love baseball. I'll do it. But I think you have to be concerned about the next generation. I don't think that they're being drawn in by the sport. My kids can't focus on anything for more than nine minutes. I'm watching Nick's. Hawks game two the other night at my home. There's three minutes to go, and my kids are watching it and intent on it, and also on their iPads playing some kind of a, a, a game. So they can't they can't focus on one thing when it's exciting to the nth degree. 
You think that baseball is exciting where kids are going to put their iPads down and say, yeah, let me watch a pitch, have 27 seconds, then another pitch, then another 24 seconds, and another pitch. Maybe there'll be a hit, maybe not, and do it over and over and over for four hours. The game of baseball, people, is broken. And I don't know what they do, but if Don Mattingly and Clayton Kershaw notice it, I think everybody does at this point. All right, it's now time for Stump Rothenberg. Let's bring in Rich. All right, Rich. What's going on, Dave? You ready to roll here? Let's go. I'm ready to roll. First off, I love your shirt. Oh, this shirt? Yeah. Oh, you know what kind of shirt this is? I do not. It's uh, Untuck It. Wow, yeah. I've heard about those guys. Yeah, your dad is a big Untuck It He is, fan. actually. Uh, yeah, he's got a whole collection. I, I've Well, I have a special treat for you and your family. And you know what? Not just you guys, for, for really anybody listening at all. This is actually a beautiful Untuck It shirt. It's actually designed to be worn untucked. You're not supposed to put it into the pants. You're supposed to leave it untucked. How about this? You're not a father, are you? No, not yet. God willing, yeah. But but you're going to be one day. Eventually, one day. Wouldn't you love it if your kids gave you a beautiful untucked shirt for Father's Day? I think it would bring tears to my eye, Dave. Okay, you could also do that for your dad right now. Buy him. Father's Day's coming up, Rich. It's not far off. You could buy your dad a beautiful untucked shirt from untuckit.com. And there's a bonus I can give you a bonus code right now I'd share with you and everybody out there as well that if you use this bonus code, you get 20% off your first purchase at untuckit.com. You want to know what the bonus code is? Dave. It's just my name. Wow. D-A-V-E. Go to untuckit.com. Use the bonus code Dave. 20% off your first purchase for you, everyone on the show, and everyone out there watching right now. That just gets me absolutely fired up for my question. Okay, let's yeah, go with ready the question. To go? I'm let's ready to go. Let's go. So the NBA mm -hmm. instituted the three-point shot yeah. in what year? <sighs> okay. Chris Ford, first ever three-pointer made, 1979. Bingo. Thank you. Attaboy. Yes. Attaboy. Celtics. Boom. 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 All right, let's bring him in. He's very good at this game, George. All right, 86 Mets. I know you're a big Mets fan. Big. Um, very weird, but back in the day, you know, guys would throw more innings, not like today. So your starters, and they had Gooden mm -hmm. and all these great guys, mm -hmm. you know, Sid Fernandez. Um, in the 1986 NLCS against okay. the Houston Astros, the Mets won the series 4-2. to two, Yes. Right? What player was credited with the most wins in that series? Oh, boy. I'm thinking of Roscoe or McDowell. Could it be Doug Sisk? All right, I'm going to have to think this one through. So they won, they won game six in, like, 16 innings. So this is going to be a bullpen guy. I feel confident this is going to be a bullpen guy. So I'm going to go McDowell or I'm going to go Orozco. Now, Orozco finished game six and threw his glove into the air, which is a famous shot. It could be Sisk. All right. I'm going bullpen. And I'm between Orozco or McDowell. I'm right on. I know mm -hmm. I'm right on. Mm -hmm. Messi, Jesse, Orozco. You got it. Boom! Two for two. Here we go. All right. Another show producer, really the executive producer of the show, and that is Joe Villalone. All right, Joe, let's see what you got today. You know, I know your laser focus on the Knicks is commendable. Thank you. But through the years, there's been... Periods of some pretty good basketball across both rivers, the East River and previously the, the Hudson River, which in fact is not a river, it is a... Oh, so this is not a, a sports question at all. It will be, it will be. So, uh, the Hudson, so give me this again now? So the Hudson River, in fact, is not a river. Okay. It is a, do you know what it is? Yeah, I know what it is. What is it's it? It's a tributary. Very good. Thank you. That doesn't surprise me that okay. you would know. No, of course, that's Something what we like do. That. You know, the Nets have some really good players. <laughs> yes, that fact they're they really do. something. Very talented team. They've had six Hall of Fame, uh, six, six retired numbers in their history. Okay. A majority of them played uh, over in New Jersey. One of the six traded, became a GM, and traded two other retired numbers when they were players. So one of the guys was a GM in the NBA. 
Yes. And traded two of the guys that are also retired. Yes. Oof. He was a GM of the Nets and traded two of the retired numbers. All right. Well, it's not Dr. J. And sadly, it's not Drazen Petrovic, who I imagine is also retired. But Dr. J is one of the ones that he traded. Yeah. So he traded Dr. J. Hmm. I don't know if I'm going to know this one. Butch Van Bredikoff. No. Oh. The answer is number 25, Bill Melchioni. Oh, all right. All right. Well, I got the tributary and I missed the other one. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Still pretty good uh, effort there in Stump Rothenberg. We've done a lot. We've laughed. We've cried. We've done it all today. Story time. Gotten into Tim Tebow, uh, the Mets and their injuries, the Islanders and their run. We'll be back next week on a show we like to call Rothenberg Untucked. Mm -hmm.